what's up everybody? I'm gonna do a classic rock reaction, man. This is an album reaction, and it's featuring the music of The Grateful Dead. Always an excellent, excellent time listening to The Grateful Dead, man. Um, the album is called Anthem of the Sun, and the recommendation is provided by Jack Sarah. Jack says, Hey Wayne, you mentioned that you wanted to delve into the psychedelic genre, so I figured, figured it would be good to introduce you to The Grateful Dead, Anthem of the Sun. Thanks and take care. Jack. Right on. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, looking forward to it. At the top of the year, one of my resolutions was to get more into uh, the psychedelic, the progressive, uh, a little bit more back to the uh, southern rock. So I've done pretty much all of that, uh, and uh, I definitely have to increase a little bit more of the psychedelic. So uh, thanks very much to Jack and a number of folks for uh, keeping me on point with my resolution. I appreciate it. September. Can you believe that shit? Can you believe we're into September already? Damn, man. Unbelievable. It's. I feel like I've been standing still the whole damn year. You know? Unbelievable. Just watching life go by. You get that feeling sometimes? There's a word for that. I can't remember what it is, but I get that feeling quite often. All right. Let's hit this shit up, man. Anthem of the Sun by the Grateful Dead. Let's go all the way through. Let's get it. bass player was for the dead, but he's just so on point. Phil, that's his name. Phil Lesh.
with rainbow colors blended. His mind remained unbending. He had to die. listen to this album just tripping out on something that must have been quite a trip
voices of the storm sound like a crown. We Eyes are blind, blue visions. Oh, oh, a seer can own. And touching makes the flesh to cry out loud. This ground on which the seed of the This jam that they're doing, they can probably do that for hours. And a deadhead fan can probably just sit there and listen to it for hours. Just tripping out for hours, just listening to this steady stream of music. It's just me always being intrigued by what gets a Grateful Dead fan. What they love so much about the dead, I think I'm tuning into their, their frequency. Subtle charms. This music is definitely for tripping out. I think it was conceived solely with that purpose in mind.
I'm just visualizing all of the kaleidoscopic colors and movements and James Bond girl silhouettes and shit like that. And I'm not even tripping. That was cool. Deadhead charm. That track is a hell of a lot longer, probably in their live acts.
they perform this number all the time live. It sounds like it was completely created to be performed live. Well, you can say that for all great songs. Instead of made a music video to this. Maybe one of the systems.
outdoor festival feel. And now it's going into the evening. And this is what they'll probably be performing in the evening. Just one old day, yes I did. didn't work too well. I went down to see this gypsy woman, you understand? Uh, and I told her my story. I told her what was going on. And she told me, man, she said, uh, all you need, all you need, all you need, all you need, all you got to have, all you need, all you need, 
That's all you need, bro. All you need. in the comment section. Really good spot there.
I didn't think it was done. It's got to be a lot of fun experimenting under the uh, umbrella of psychedelic and creating all of these sounds. Okay, I think that's it now. <laughs> it's a long ass outro. They got together and they said, okay man, this album, Anthem of the Sun, it's for the sole purpose, for fan service. People who want to go on a trip, people who want to go on a damn band, people who want to uh, hang out with Lucy in the sky with diamonds, people who want to just do that. This album is for them. Yeah, man, you just sit, shut your mind off, or let your imagination soar, your other eye, or whatever it is, however you describe it, and just go, right? That's what this album was intended for, if I'm not mistaken. Good album, man. It's got a lot of the, what I call the Grateful Dead subtleties in there. Their subtleties being the way they play. You know, the bass groove, the organ comes in there. Jerry's guitar plucking. Sometimes it seems aimless, but that's a part of the charm of it all. And their vocals, of course, their harmonies, all of those things in there that makes the Grateful Dead great is in this album. And like I said, yeah, I think it was just intended for you just to go on a trip, man. And it's definitely done that. And, you know, the only thing that I'm uh, uh, tripping on is my sugarcane rum. But that's enough. So, great album, man. Great music. It's one of those things, man. If you've got all the time in the world and you want to just chill out and do nothing, shut the world out and just trip, sit down and just go off, this is, this album would be a great companion. And just reliving the times, you know? All right, let's go straight into a review here, man. Uh, a lot of information. It seems to be like a lot of factual, trivial information, bullet points and stuff. So, man, yeah, I'll have to bounce around because I can't read it all. Try and see more of the uh, nuts and bolts of the uh, album and the construct of it. Anthem of the Sun. Anthem of the Sun is the second album by rock band The Grateful Dead, released in 68 on Warner Brothers' Seven Hearts. It's the first album to feature second drummer Mickey Hart. The band was also joined by Tom Constantine, who contributed avant-garde instrumental and studio techniques influenced by composers John Cage and Carl Heinz Stockhausen. The album was assembled through a collage-like editing approach helmed by members Jerry Garcia and Phil Lesh, along with sound man Dan Healy, in which Disparate studio and live performance tapes were spliced together to create new hybrid recordings. Yeah, that's what they were doing in the outro of the last song here. The band also supplemented their performances with instruments such as prep piano, kazoo, uh, harpist chord, timpani, trumpet, and gyro. Gyro. G-U-I-R-O. The result is an experimental amalgam that is neither a studio album, nor a live album, but both at the same time. 
In 92, a more commercial alternate mix of the album was officially released to capitalize on the band's recent success. In 2018, uh, a 2018 reissue on Rhino Records collects both the 68 and 72 mixes. The album was ranked number 288 on Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time in both the 2003 and 20, 2012 iterations of the list. It was voted number 376 in Colin Larkin's all-time top 1,000 albums. Recording. Uh, yeah, recording. There's a... Oh, man. Tremendous amount of info here. I can't read all of this, man. The recording information. Even though I bet you the bulk of all the good information is in it, I can't read it all. Let's read the first two paragraphs. The band entered American Studios in L.A. November 67 with David Hazinger, the producer of their eponymous debut album. However, determined to make a more complicated recorded work than their debut release, as well as attempt to translate their live sound into the studio, the band and Hazinger changed locations in changed locations to New York City. By December, they had gone through two other studios, Century Sound and Olmsted Studios, both highly regarded 8-track studios. Eventually, Hazinger grew frustrated with the group's slow recording pace and quit the project entirely while the band was at Century Sound, with only a third of the album complete. It had been reported that he left after the guitarist Bob Weir requested creating the illusion of thick air in the studio by mixing recordings of silence taken in the desert and the studio, and the city, sorry. Hazinger commented that nobody could sing. Nobody could sing the new tracks recorded in New York City, and that at that point they were experimenting too much in my opinion. They didn't know what the hell they were looking for, unquote. That would be really, really frustrating, uh, definitely for a producer. Yeah. Or in this case, he was an engineer. Garcia noted that we wanted to learn how the studio worked. We didn't want somebody else doing it. It's our music. We wanted to do it, unquote. Yeah. But having somebody waiting for you to uh, get the show on the road and you going on your own pace, sometimes it doesn't work for all involved. I, I understand. I get uh, Dude's point of view. Returning to San Francisco's Coast Recorders, the band recruited their sound man Dan Healy to help produce. In between studio sessions, the band also began recording their live dates. Lesh commented that this was a part, this was in part because the songs were not road tested. Healy Garcia and Lesh then took these concept tapes encompassing two LA shows from November of 67, a tour of the Pacific Northwest in January and early February 68, and a California tour from mid-February to mid-March of 68, and began interlacing them with existing studio tracks. Garcia called this mixing. Garcia called this mixing it for hallucinate. Oh my god, I'm right. See? Garcia called this mixing it for the hallucinations. Man, I was so right about this. I said that these guys got together and they said, let's just do this album solely for people who want to go on a trip. There it is. Uh, Krautsman explained, Phil and Jerry were the ones who figured out that we could exploit studio technology to demonstrate how these songs were mirrors of infinity even when they adhere to their established arrangements. It's the old paradox of improvisational compositions. Jazz artists knew all about the balance between freedom and structure, but a few rock bands were now catching on. Most rock bands, however, tended to head in an opposite direction, afraid of the uncertainty of improvisation. Not Led Zeppelin. You know, uh, there's some bands out there that just went in that direction. The Grateful Dead, Led Zeppelin, definitely comes to mind. We decided that Anthem of the Sun was going to be our statement on the matter. Drummer Bill Krautsman's description of the product 
uh, of the production process describes the listening experience of the album as well. Okay, so a uh, big quote from him. Quote, Jerry and Phil went into the studio with Dan, and like, mind, like mad scientists, they started splicing all the versions together, creating hybrids that contained the studio tracks and various live parts, stitching them together from different shows, all in the same song. One rendition would dissolve into another, and sometimes they were even stacked on top of each other. It was easily our most experimental record. It was groundbreaking in its time, and it remains a psychedelic listening experience to this day. Unquote. Wow. Um, yeah, let's read one more. This is interesting shit. Tom Constantin, a friend of Lesh and Garcia, joined the band in the studio while on leave from the US from the US Air Force to provide piano, prepared piano and electronic tape effects influenced by John Cage and Stockhausen. Constantin would formally join the band following his discharge in November of 68. However, his contributions to the band sound were more evident in the studio than in live shows, and Anthem of the Sun was no exception. Constantin developed piano pieces that sounded like three gameland orchestras playing at once and created effects by setting a spinning gyroscope on the piano soundboard. Likewise, the rest of the band used a large assortment of instruments in the studio to augment the live tracks that were the, ba that were the base of each song, including kazoos. Yo, look at the list. Okay, man, they used a whole, they used pretty much every instrument you can think of. I'm not going to read this big-ass list. Garcia commented that parts of the album were far out, even too far out. We weren't making a record in the normal sense. We were making a collage, unquote. That is for sure, man. You can hear that in their sounds and all the different places. And I remember saying that, yeah, you know, they are just, um, there's just so much to listen to. But that's a part of the uh, the charm of it all. He also acknowledged the influence of Lesh's studio of Stockhausen and other avant-garde artists. Warner Brothers executive Joe Smith was noted as characterizing Anthem of the Sun as the most unreasonable project with which we have ever involved ourselves. <laughs> Unquote. Jerry's longtime friend and songwriter partner Robert Hunter had made his first lyrical contributions to the band the previous year for Dark Star. He added words to the Lesh Pigpen composition Alligator on this album. Okay, y'all, we're gonna have to stop there because, man, there is just so much more information about the release itself, and then there was just, uh, yeah, there's all of these remasterings and box sets and it's like a whole bunch of uh, trivial bullet points. So yeah, I think we'll stop there. It's, it's so much information here. Um, yeah, and there's no critical uh, reception for this particular uh, album review. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, but you know what? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's about you, the listener, if you like the shit or if you don't in the end. Who gives a damn what critics really have to say? You know, I mean, they're just a basis to kind of give you a barometer of what was happening and the times, you know, comparing apples to oranges and stuff like that. But they're not the end all where it comes to impressions on music. Certainly not. So draw your own conclusions, man. I liked it. You know, it's got all of those elements, like I said before, that makes the Grateful Dead uh, the great band that they are. And uh, even with splicing things together and taking all of that time to do that, they're driven by passion. They're following their bliss. And what might seem like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, like the engineer that quit, it probably seemed like forever and a day for him. You know, he's outside of their fold, you know. For them, it's just their creative process and they're enjoying every moment of it, you know. So I totally understand the point of view from both sides. But yeah, that is one of those things that make these guys so endearing and so great, man. And there's just uh, nobody else like them, you know. So when you uh, look back in time, 
uh, down the annals and the history of rock and roll, and then you come upon the Grateful Dead, there's just so much to unpack about them. That's a part of their charm. Special place. Special place. All right. So, y'all, that concludes our look at this excellent album, man. Uh, Jack, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Uh, speaking of you, Jack, I also have um, a reaction coming up for you in a couple of days on the uh, Beyond platform. I think it's actually tomorrow, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So look for that as well. Uh, what I'll do here is um, I'll also, if I remember, attach, uh, fingers crossed, supposing that we're going to make this up, up onto YouTube, I'll try and attach Ron Pickpen McKernan's uh, Spotlight. I'm trying to think now, did it actually make it up onto YouTube? Even if it didn't, I'll try to um, re-upload and see what happens with the algorithm. But I'll do my best to see if I can attach it. It would be quite appropriate to do so. Anyways, guys, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Always a good listen for the Grateful Dead, man. You know, uh, taking a nice trip. This is a, uh, an album that I would listen to on one of those. Usually Sunday afternoons is my chillin', unwinding, uh, after a long week kind of day. And I would uh, listen to a lot of what I had reacted to previously. So I would save this for a really nice, lazy Sunday afternoon kind of thing. You know, it would be cool to do that. Anyways, have a good one, y'all. Take care. Have uh, Next time you see me, um, let me just go to my calendar real quick here. I can't remember uh, what I got coming up and who's next. Uh, Finesse. Finesse Muse. Finesse Muse is coming up next, and I think Finesse uh, has, uh, yeah, I think Finesse has, um, I think it's early Chicago, I think that I'm doing. Somebody else recently sent me uh, some Chicago stuff, so I'm not sure. I might actually uh, amalgamate um, if it doesn't take too much time away, but we'll see what goes. But yeah, Finesse Muse. I think you're up next, brother, and I'm pretty sure it's um, some early Chicago's with uh, Terry Cat that's uh, coming up. So looking forward to that. Anyways, have a good one, guys. Take care. Have a safe day, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace. <laughs>